Well, amen. Thank you, choir and orchestra and Kinsley. That was awesome. We appreciate that ministry and message in music. A few years ago, my kids learned a song in vacation Bible school, a simple song, but the there was a line in the song that really encapsulates what you and I have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. And the title of the song was simply this. Sin messed everything up. Can I get an amen? Sin messed everything up. Uh, We, every day, have to deal with the results of sin all around us, and we even have to deal with some sin within us. And it's a struggle. At the end of Romans chapter 7, Paul really details that struggle in his own life. He says, the the good that I want to do, I don't do, and uh, the things I don't want to do, I do. And he said, I I found this principle within me. There's a war raging on the inside between the old me and the new me. And Paul explains how difficult that is. So when we get to Romans chapter 8, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, begins to share some glorious truths that serve as encouragement for Christians that feel the angst of that struggle. And these past weeks, we've been looking at these three great encouragements for the Christian walk. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the first encouragement, that the penalty for sin has been removed. We studied Romans chapter 8, verse 1, when the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We were reminded that even as Christians, when we stumble and fall, we're not under condemnation. Jesus Christ took our condemnation for us, and we are secure in our relationship with God. That's the first great encouragement. Last week we saw that in this Christian walk, the power of sin is being conquered by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Yes, the Christian walk can be difficult, but God has not left us without a helper. He gave us the third person of the Trinity to live on the inside of us, to give us the the wherewithal to say no to sin and yes to God. And so we are not in this fight alone, and that is a great encouragement. Well, this week we're going to finish up this series by discussing how the results of sin, the devastating results of sin, are in actuality being reversed by God. As we see what this looks like, it will encourage us to keep on keeping on in the Christian life. So keeping that in mind, look with me in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I want us to begin reading in verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I want to ask you this morning, if you are physically able, to please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Just a quick note on the preaching schedule. Next week, we will begin a series from Isaiah 9 titled, His Name Shall Be Called. There are four titles for Jesus Uh, given to him over 700 years before he actually was born to the Virgin Mary. And those four titles really describe the person and the the ministry of Christ. And so we'll look at those uh, over four uh, weeks, four Sundays in December. And then in the new year, when the dust settles, we're in 2020, can you believe it? We're almost to 2020. Uh, We will begin a study through the Gospel of Mark. So I'm really excited about that. So just give you a heads up as, as to where we are headed. Look there in uh, chapter 8, verse 18 of Romans. We're going to just read one verse, but we're going to come back to this text again and again and again this morning. Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings... Why are there sufferings? Everybody look at me for a moment. Sin messed everything up. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing 
with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Yes, there are sufferings, but there is a great reversal happening by the grace of God. Let's pray together this morning. Father in heaven, we are, we are grateful for so many things. Grateful for this land in which we live. Grateful for the freedom that we enjoy. Grateful, Lord, for our church family. Grateful, Lord, for this opportunity to gather together today and worship you in spirit and in truth. We are grateful for the finished work of Christ. His death, His burial, His resurrection that is bringing about a great reversal concerning the, the devastation that sin has caused. So give us insight into this text. Open the eyes of our hearts by your Spirit. Help us to understand what we are studying and grip our hearts with these truths that we might be changed, that you might be glorified. And we ask and pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As we think about this third great encouragement, the results of sin are being reversed, there are two headings to the sermon that I want to share with you uh, this morning. Not a three-point sermon, a two-point sermon. Can you handle it? Okay, all right. Unless I get going, I may throw a third point in there, so you just never know, all right? But, but the first heading related to this, this reversal of sin is this. I want us to think about the effects of sin. You can't understand the reversal that's happening until you understand the great effects of sin. And you can't understand the effects of sin. In, in, in fact, you can't understand Romans chapter 8 properly until you understand what happened over in Genesis chapter 3. So hold your place, but turn to Genesis 3 with me. I want to show you some, some effects of sin when sin entered the world. Now a little bit of backdrop to Genesis chapter 3, the first book in the Bible. We see in chapters 1 and 2 that... God created everything. He created Adam and Eve, male and female. He created them and gave them to one another as, uh, as, as a, a, a gift so that they were married. The first marriage happened between Adam and Eve, and they were living in perfection. They were living in the Garden of Eden, created by God. They were living in paradise, living in uh, communion with God in fellowship with one another. Everything was wonderful and they were given the wonderful task of tending the garden and enjoying uh, the, the fruits uh, from the garden. But God gave them one command that they were, one prohibition that they were to keep. God said there's this certain tree and there's some fruit on that tree and I don't want you to eat that fruit. Well one day Satan comes slithering into the garden, taking on the form of a serpent. And he twists the words of God, and he entices Eve. And Eve takes a bite of the fruit, and then she gives it to Adam. Adam takes a bite of the fruit, and they disobeyed God. And at that moment, sin entered the world. Sin began to mess everything and I want to show you just quickly the effects of uh, Adam and Eve's sin. First of all, there was a fallen creation. A fallen creation. Look what it says there uh, in chapter 3, verse 17. This is the Lord talking to Adam and Eve uh, after their sin, confronting them with their sin. And he said to Adam, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you should not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What is God saying? He's saying, because you disobeyed me, sin has entered the created order through your disobedience, and now sin will affect the creation. And you will experience this because it's going to be hard to, to exercise dominion over creation. He's saying you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. And you have to work to, to grow crops. And you need to understand that as you work to tend the fields, 
creation will not be cooperating with you. It will be it will be against you. And we all experience that, don't we? That's why we have to put um, weed killer on our flower beds to keep the grass from growing in the flower bed, but we got to put fertilizer on the grass to get it to grow. Things aren't cooperating, are they? I mean, we, we, we see the created order is fallen because of sin. That's why we have things like hurricanes and tornadoes and raging forest fires and droughts and famine. And we could go on and on and on. We live in a, in a world that has been cursed by sin. We live in a fallen creation. And the Lord told Adam that's exactly what's going to happen, and that's exactly what has happened. But not only was fallen creation one of the effects of sin, but mortality is one of the effects of sin. Uh, he says there in verse 19 to Adam, he says, you're going you're to work and, 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 and uh, exercise dominion by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground. You were, out, you were taken out of it, for you are dust to dust you shall return. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were immortal. They were going to live in, in fellowship with God forever. But after they sinned, sin entered their, mortal, uh, their bodies and made them mortal. Sin began to corrupt them, began to affect their physical situation. And we see this really clearly over in Genesis chapter 5. In Genesis chapter 5, there is a listing of Adam's descendants. And it says, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and and then three words, and he died. And then so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he died. Died And then so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he died. All the way through the chapter, we see that people are dying now. Why? Sin had entered the world and began to corrupt humanity itself. And Adam and Eve and all of his descendants, including us in this room today, experience the reality of mortality. Can I remind you of the statistics? One out of one die. You say, it's kind of morbid, but it's true. It's true. I remember I was listening to the radio uh, one day, and they were talking about the, the greatest causes of death in our society in America. And, and they were talking about the number one cause of death, and, and they were talking about some initiatives to try to deal with that because it's the number one cause, so it's no longer the number one cause. And I had the thought, well, when we fix the number one cause, there's going to be a new number one. Right? Right? No matter how much we figure out about health care and what we endure physically, there's always going to be a number one cause of death, and a second, and a third, because we are mortal. Sin comes into this world through Adam and Eve, and it corrupts even us today, because we are born with a sin nature. And every day, listen to me, every day, we are one step closer to our death than we were the day before. That'll bless you on Thanksgiving, won't it? That'll... But it's true. Every single one of us, we live in decaying bodies. If I didn't have contacts on, I wouldn't be able to see any of you this morning. Right? I mean, our bodies are decaying. They're not, they're not getting better. They're, they're, they're decaying. Why? Sin messed everything up. Sin entered the world through the sin of Adam and Eve, and affected humanity from that point on. That's why we die. That's why we experience mortality. But there's a third effect of sin that's even more devastating than that. And it is separation from God. Separation from God. Remember, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden in perfect fellowship and harmony with God. But the end of chapter 3, they have to leave the garden, don't they? Why? This was to signify that because of your sin, 
You can no longer walk in perfect fellowship with me. The sin has separated you from me. That's what God is saying by removing them from the garden. Separation from God. Now, God made provision. We see that in chapter 3, verse 15. We'll talk about that in a moment. But, but he wanted Adam and Eve to feel the separation that sin brought on. And, and they're leaving the garden is an illustration of all of our lives. When we sin against a holy God, we are separated from that holy God by our own impurity. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. When we sin against a holy God... There's separation. There's a barrier of impurity between us and God. And we are far from Him, unable to know Him, unable to experience relationship with Him because of our sin. Sin separates from God. But there's a fourth effect of sin. Not only a fallen creation, mortality, and separation from God, but chaos. Just chaos. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, notice what the Lord says in verse 16. He speaks to Eve. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. So there, there's actually now physical pain related to giving birth. And your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. In other words, there's going to be this tension between husband and wife in, in that uh, relationship. And then over in chapter 4, we see how sin is spreading and bringing about devastation when we read the story of Cain and Abel, brothers. And Cain, because of jealousy, kills his brother. And it just gets worse from there. Sin devastates humanity to such a degree that in... Uh, Chapter 6, God decides to send a great flood because humanity is so wicked. And after the flood, he starts over with Noah, and guess what? There's still wickedness, still sin, still brokenness, still devastation, chaos. Sin, listen to me, sin wreaks havoc in our lives. And sin wreaks havoc in the lives of our loved ones. Sin messes everything up. And it all goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Now you might say, okay, this is a depressing beginning of the sermon. We feel, don't we, the effects of sin. But in the midst of our struggle with sin... And the struggle of living in a fallen world, listen, God has given us hope. He gives us some encouraging truths. And, and here's the bottom line. Back in Romans 8, Romans 8, we'll see that God is actively working to reverse the devastating effects of sin in our world and in our lives. So we've talked about the effects of sin, but now I want to talk to you about the great reversal. What is God doing What has God done to deal with these effects of sin that all of us struggle with? Well, first of all, God is going to redeem the fallen creation. Remember I I said that the the, the effect of sin was a a sin-cursed world, a fallen creation, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes, you know, a a broken creation. God is going to do something about it. Back in Romans chapter 8... Verse 18, look what the Bible says. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation, watch this, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. He's waiting for God to come back and and take care of everything. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. In other words, when sin entered the world... God said sin is going to affect the created order. In hope, though, that the creation itself, watch this, 
will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. It compares the, the fallen creation and the pain that our created order is experiencing to a, to a woman in labor with, with childbirth pains. Every time there is a typhoon, the creation is groaning. Every time there's a hurricane, the creation is groaning. Every tornado, the creation is is groaning. Every flood, the creation is groaning. Every drought, the creation is groaning. Things are not like they ought to be. We live in a fallen world, but God is going to do something about it. You say, well, what is God going to do? Well, in the same way that we will be redeemed, a moment, uh, more on that in a moment, the creation will be redeemed. That's what he's saying. The creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption. This means that one day, God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. Revelation 21, verse 1. I don't know all that that entails. I don't know what that's going to look like. But the Bible says the old heavens, the old earth will pass away and we will get a brand new heavens and a brand new earth in which to enjoy eternity. Now, our creation is fallen, but it's still pretty incredible, right? The Grand Canyon. My daughter asked me this weekend, why is the Grand Canyon so famous? I said, because it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's astounding to look at this Grand Canyon. We, Mount Everest, the, the oceans, the plains, the rivers, the valleys, the, the universe. It is fallen. It is corrupted by sin. But it's still extraordinary. Can you imagine what the new heavens and new earth are going to be like? Now, I believe, and, and uh, you know, I think there's some scripture that can back this up. But I believe that part of eternity is we get to experience the new heavens and the new earth. Now, a lot of pictures of eternity are, you know, we get our angel wings, we're sitting on a cloud with halos, and we're, you know, we're, you know, playing our harps, right? Listen, I hope not for me, okay? I mean, I have no musical ability, I hope not. Sure, there's going to be music in heaven and singing and worship and rejoicing, but it says in Revelation uh, 22 that the gates of the new Jerusalem, the centerpiece of heaven, will be open. People will be coming and going through those gates, which indicates we get to, I believe, explore the new heavens and the new earth. Now, can I just tell you this? I don't want to climb Mount Everest because I'm a chicken. I don't want to die on that mountain. Can I get an amen on that? All right? New heavens, new earth. I'm immortal. Guess what? I'm going to climb some mountains. All right? I'm going to enjoy the new created order. God is going to make everything new. Can you imagine how extraordinary that will be? Yes, sin messed up creation. But one day, he's going to make it all brand new. Wow. We get to experience it. Not only that, but God is going to redeem our bodies. Remember the second effect of sin, mortality? One out of one die. Our bodies are corrupted. We are hurtling towards our appointment with death. Well, one day God's going to give us new bodies. Uh, Look in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. He talks about the new creation. Then he says, not only the creation... So not, God's not only going to deal with the created order, look what he says, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our what? Bodies. God's going to redeem creation, new heavens, new earth. God's going to redeem our corrupted bodies. He's going to give us brand, listen, Brand new, glorified bodies in which to enjoy eternity in. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. 1 Corinthians 15, 
Verse 52 says this and following. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. Listen, imperishable and we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? If I were to fall down right now before you, dead. By the way, what a way to go in the pulpit. But anyway, I hope it doesn't happen today, but... If I were to fall down dead, my body would be laying here in front of you. But the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So immediately when I breathe my last, my soul will be in heaven with Jesus. That's good news, isn't it? Good news. Nothing to fear. We don't have to fear death as Christians. But hopefully you do something about my body, right? Maybe some kind of service, hopefully something. Comfort Claire and the kids, and and uh, you would you 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 you'd put my body into the ground where it would continue its decaying process. I, I wouldn't be in my body; my soul's in heaven with Jesus, but my body would go into the ground. Well, here's what First Corinthians 15 promises, and it's so glorious. One day, Jesus is going to come back. And when that happens. It's going to be incredible. Because you walk through a, a cemetery now, and it's quiet, and it's peaceful, and it's serene. On the day when Jesus Christ returns, the cemeteries will be exciting places. Because Jesus is going to come back for his, for his children, for his people. And every Christian will have their body raised from the ground. And when that happens, when he raises our bodies, the Bible says they'll be raised incorruptible, imperishable, immortal, brand new bodies. And at that moment, my soul, which has been in heaven with Jesus, will be reunited with my body. I'll be given a new body and I will experience heaven forever with Jesus, with my saved loved ones in my brand new body. How cool is that? Sin messed everything up. Sin has corrupted even my body, but God's given me a new body. He'll bring about redemption to my body. Here's what that means if you're not excited yet. That means no more cancer. No more diabetes. No more dementia. Our new bodies will be perfect, and we get them forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. God is going to redeem our bodies. That is a great reversal. But two other things very quickly, and we'll be through. Not only is God going to redeem creation and redeem our bodies, God has made a way for us to have a relationship with Him. You remember I said one of the effects of sin is you're kicked out of the garden. Sin separates you from God. But God is doing something so that we don't have to be separated from God. We can have a relationship with God. Look what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Glorious verses. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who saves. It is God who, who makes us have a right relationship with him. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who, here it is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? The answer is no. You see, Jesus came to this earth and he lived a perfect life. He went to the cross and on the cross he took all of your sin, which separates us from God, He took all of your sin on himself. And on the cross, he died in our place. He took the punishment that you and I deserve. 
So that if we believe in Jesus, if we trust him as our Lord and Savior, his shed blood is applied to our spiritual account and our sins, oh, it's so good, our sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. Our sins are taken away. That means there's no longer a barrier of impurity between us and a holy God. The barrier's been taken away by Jesus, so now we can enjoy a relationship with God. No more separation. No more separation. God sent his son, Jesus, to die and to rise again so he could take our sin away. And we don't have to remain distant from God. We can trust him and be adopted by God, have a relationship with God. Nothing and no one can ever separate us from that relationship. In fact, if you look there in your notes, this is so important. Because of Jesus... Instead of being separated from God, listen, now we cannot be separated from God. Because of Jesus, instead of being separated from God, now we cannot be separated from God. This is true of you if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You have a relationship with Him and nothing and no one can separate you from God. Isn't that good news? Yes, sin separates. Sin messed everything up. But God has done something about it in the death of his son Jesus so we can know God personally. It's wonderful, wonderful news. Now you might be out there this morning and say, okay, Pastor Wade, all this pie in the sky, you know, we're going to get to heaven, everything's going to be right when we get to heaven and I hear what you're saying, but I mean, what about today? What about tomorrow? What about the chaos you mentioned that started in Genesis chapter 3? I hear what you're saying about heaven and new bodies, and, but, but life is hard. What about the here and now? What about the struggles that we experience? Do you have anything to say about those, or we just have to wait for heaven for anything good? Can I tell you this? God works in and through even the chaos caused by sin for our good. One day God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. One day God's going to redeem our bodies, give us brand new glorified bodies. In Christ, we're not separated from God. We have a relationship with God And even in the chaos, God is at work. Romans 8, 28. Look look at what he says. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. You say, life is hard. Yes, it is. But God is even using the hard stuff ultimately for your good and for His glory. Only God can do that. Only God can take the brokenness and bring about blessing. Only God can take the mess and make a message out of it. Only God can work through the chaos and ultimately bring about our good. So God even deals graciously with the mess we deal with every day. The struggle with inward sin, the the troubles around us caused by sin. God is at work in the chaos. Two things about the chaos. Number one, the chaos cannot affect your status as a child of God. If you're a Christian, the chaos cannot affect your status as a child of God. Look how this chapter ends, verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that good news? Nothing, not even the chaos can separate you from your relationship with God. 
And God works in and through that chaos for our ultimate good. Wow. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is this. Sin messed everything up. Life is challenging and difficult. But God's got you covered. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives in you to help you. And God is actually, listen, reversing the effects of sin in our life and in our world. Wow! God's got you covered. And all of this is available for those who follow Jesus. If you choose not to follow Christ, you are choosing to continue under the weight of all of these devastating effects. So be encouraged. The penalty of sin has been removed. The power of sin is being conquered. The results of sin are being reversed. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote a trilogy titled The Lord of the Rings. And in the third book, there's a, there's a moving passage. Near the end of the book, The Return of the King, one of the characters realizes that evil has been defeated. And the king is being restored to his rightful place. And one of his friends he thought was dead, it was alive. And he's so overwhelmed by all of these wonderful things. He asked this question. Listen to the question he asks. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Is everything sad going to come untrue? And we look at our world, all of the, the effects of sin, and we might ask the same question. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Let me let Jesus answer that question for you. In Revelation 21 verse 5, Jesus says, Behold, I am making all things new. 